Uh, hello, everyone. Just want to give a quick thank you for uh, Chris for uh, inviting me to present today, and uh, Lisa and Charlie for helping organize this event. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about deep learning and NLP, <coughs> and uh, more specifically, attention mechanisms and translation systems. And a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Alex Wolf. I'm a data scientist at Data IQ. I joined the team in June 2017. Uh, I studied computer science and statistics at uh, Dartmouth. Uh, I actually played basketball there, hence the photo. And uh, I've I also done a lot of other software business development for a lot of startups. And here are some of the things I'm very interested in. So, um, for this presentation, first I'm going to talk about the motivation for the project, and then give an uh, introduction to uh, machine translation history, give a bit of a technical foundation, if any of you are unfamiliar with deep learning and NLP, and then talk about attention mechanisms and the transformer model I use to make the translator, and then jump into code and give a live demo of the translator in action. So first off, project motivation. So, uh, you know, DataIQ is a diverse international company. We were founded in Paris in 2013. Uh, our headquarters is in New York City now. Um, but, you know, we have like a Japanese company name, employees from all over the world, like Singapore, Ireland, uh, Germany. Um, and we use a lot of different channels for internal communication. That includes uh, HipChat, GitHub, email. Um, but, you know, all of us, we, everyone speaks English, just like we mainly use English, but in these team chats, you know, because most of our team's French and they're in the Paris office, uh, people speak like French in the team chats all the time. And uh, I'm not good, at, I don't know any French, I have like, no idea what they're talking about. A lot of my American coworkers have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and I kind of wanted to solve that. So, uh, another motivation for this project. So, just like how Data IQ is an international company, we have clients who are international like us. Uh, for example, Unilever, um, you know, they own a lot of brands across the world, and they collect text data in a lot of different languages, like tweets on uh, their products, review data, their interactions with customers, et cetera. And in order to perform like, good analysis on that text data, it needs to be in a uniform language. So uh, you need to be able to like, have a translator to merge all those languages together. Um, so when I was thinking about solutions for this, like how do I want to make this translator, you know, the first thing that came to mind is, oh, why don't I just use Google Translate? You know, the translator is pretty good. They have an API I could use, which can integrate into a lot of different products. But uh, it's actually not the best solution. Um, and why is that? So first off, there's an API call limit. So if I wanted to translate a massive data set of millions and millions of rows, I wouldn't be able to do it continuously. Also, Google steals your text data when you translate it. Um, that's not a big deal for me if I'm just trying to translate one of my coworkers' like French text, or I'm trying to do like my Spanish homework in college. <laughs> but um, for our clients who really care about their data security, that's a pretty big issue. They don't want Google having all their important text data. It's also expensive. It's about twenty dollars for one million characters, and that can add up very quickly. Um, so. When I thought about other ways to do this, why don't I just make the translator myself, use Python, TensorFlow, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, and deep learning projects are really fun. Um, thanks to the like, open source community, uh, kind of do it yourself is kind of like the new motto in ML and AI. So I was like, okay, let me do this. This will be an awesome, fun project. Um, before I kind of jump into everything, I just want to give a quick introduction to machine translation because we've come a really long way thanks to deep learning in a really short period of time. Um, so first, let me just give an introduction to machine translation. Um, and this is actually a really, really tough thing for computers to do. And let me explain why. Uh, so first off, translation is an easy task for humans. I like struggled in language classes. Well, I wouldn't say struggled, but definitely wasn't my strong suit uh, throughout like high school and college. And even expert translators aren't like perfect translators. Um, and when you're making machine learning, uh, especially deep learning models, you need to have a lot, a lot of labeled te accurate text data. So uh, this makes like, acquiring a lot of labeled data difficult, because you need to have uh, really good uh, translators translate like millions and millions of sentences. Um, also, languages are very different. Um, they have their own different ways to represent past tense, future tense, subjunctive. Uh, some languages like French have gender noun agreement. Other languages like English don't. So if I'm making a, tra a machine translator, the model is going to have to be intuitive and recognize these differences and translate it automatically on its own. Also, just language is just very, very complex. It's built in a very hierarchical manner. Manner. So there's like letters, then there's words, and there's sentences and like paragraphs, documents. 
And there's also word meaning, sentence meaning, like themes in my like documents. So when you're making machine learning, you need to have numbers. So you need to have a way to convert this text and these letters to numbers. But which level of the model should you target? Um, like how do you do this? And this is something NLP practitioners are still researching how to do optimally for different types of NLP problems. Um, and humans, we process language so intuitively and we kind of take it for granted how amazingly our brains work. Um, we kind of understand sarcasm uh, very easily. We get common sense. Um, we're able to pick up like new words and concepts like effortlessly. Um, and computers really can't do this at all, although they're starting to thanks to deep learning. And to give an example of this, um, there's something called co-reference resolution, which is uh, the task of finding all the words related to another word in the text. Um, this has been something that's been notoriously challenging for computers. So if we look at this sentence right here, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So if we want to translate this to, to French, French has a gender noun agreement. So you need to know if it, it relates to animal or the street. But those are two different genders. Um, you know, us humans, we intuitively know that a, um, an animal is it can get tired, but a street's not living, so it can't get tired. But you know, how is the computer going to be intuitive and be able to like translate that? So um, this is something difficult, and uh, based on deep learning, we can finally actually do some cool solving. And I'll give another example of this later, which shows how. Um, and now I'm just going to give a quick um, kind of machine translation history, so you can kind of see the progress and how far we've come. So the first translator ever to be public was. Uh, created by IBM in Georgetown in 1954. And this was a purely like rule-based statistical model. Um, and then in 1996, the first web-based translator tool gets released called Babelfish. And then 10 years later, Google Translate gets released. And then it wasn't until around like 2013, 2014 when the deep learning revolution started. And the first scientific paper for machine translation gets released in 2014. Uh, two years later, Google updates their translation system to use deep learning. And the results were so remarkable, people were blogging about it for about like three months after. And they were like amazed. And then in 2017, the research paper for the transformer architecture comes out, and that's the model I use to develop my translator. And I'll get up into the, um, <coughs> the architecture in a bit. So, um, so this is called machine translation. So what is it? So it's a bunch of, like, a bunch of hand-coded rules of how certain words and phrases translate. And then you use like probability and statistics on training data to make the translations. Um, but there's a lot of issues with statistical machine translation. Uh, first off, they're really bad at translating material if it wasn't related to the training data. Uh, also, they can't be intuitive like humans at all. You would have to like hand code every little like piece of common sense or sarcasm to like get it to understand that. Um, and also, these translations have to be post-edited frequently, and that isn't ideal if you want like a robust translation system. And you're like trying to translate millions and millions of rows of text. Um, and then deep learning comes along. Uh, and I just want to give a quick introduction to deep learning if any of you aren't familiar with it. So uh, deep learning is a type of machine learning model uh, like based off of how the human brain works. So you have a network of neurons, and the data flows from um, layer to layer. Um, and from, um, <coughs> so all the uh, neurons in this layer will go to the next layer. And then you can have as many layers as you want, as many neurons in each layer. Um, and what makes these systems really powerful is that there's something called an activation function at the end of each neuron. And this is able to create a nonlinearity in the data, and the models will be able to learn things on their own. Um, and one of the most popular types of activation function is something called a rectified linear unit. And what this basically means is, if the, so at, at the end of these, each of these neurons, you'll have like one number when you do all this math and some summation. And in the rectified linear unit, so if the number's positive, leave it as it is. And if it's negative, you make it zero. And what this does is the model is able to, on its own, as it's learning and being provided training data and labels, to just like learn uh, like futures on their own. So there's no need to hand uh, like engineer futures. And that's like just like how our brains work, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and neural networks are optimized through something called uh, gradient descent and backpropagation. But that's like a whole talk in itself, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, so deep learning and translation. Uh, the first ever, uh, so there's something called the WMT translation contest, and uh, these have been like ruled by statistical based models um, before deep learning came out, and there was like minimal progress in it. And then when deep learning first started to get popular, now in 2015, someone actually released a deep learning model for that, 
and it still wasn't as good as the uh, statistical based models. But then a year later, it's better. Um, as you can see, there's a clear upward linear trend for this, um, and it's like um, it's continued to it's uh, continually to improve. And then these aren't going up at all. Um, and you, something you use for translation is called the blue score to measure its accuracy. So you can't just use the regular accuracy metric because there's multiple different ways to translate a text. So if you just have like one translation label, like the model may translate it perfectly well, but uh, it may be like a different sentence than the label. So um, you, can use, you can use something called the blue score metric. It's the most commonly used metric for tra measuring uh, translation. And you essentially just like count the n-grams. So you look at all the n-grams in the translated text and then uh, compare and count how many times they occur in that and then compare it to, to the labeled translation text and count that out and uh, sum it. And then you can compare it to multiple different types of translations. So you can compare it to multiple sentences. Um, and this, so this is like the standard score for uh, translation. Um, another important technical foundation to understand before I talk about the model architecture is something called a word vector. Um, and these are used in all like NLP deep learning models and uh, it produces like, uh, helps produce state of the art results. Why is that? So you can use deep learning to create uh, a vector for each word. And what's really cool about these is that the, if you look at like a vector space, um, if you look at the distances between these two vectors, the closer two vectors are means like the closer in meaning the words are. So like, for example, the two words like king and queen would be really close to each other, like uh, sitting and laying down, et cetera. And this allows the model when you input a data to already have somewhat of a context of word meaning. Um, and it's like a number format. That's what we want, we need numbers for machine learning. And this enables neural machine translators to just kind of understand word relationships um, from, the, from the input data. Um, so some of the first types of neural networks used uh, for natural language processing is something called a recurrent neural network. And how this works is that data is processed left to right. Um, so you can have an input sequence of x length. Here it's only three. And uh, each of these are word vectors, right? And then on the first step, the words can be processed through here. You can do that math. And there's something called a hidden state, which you keep. And then uh, when, you, when you take the next step, the result from this is going to go to this neuron, and then this one's going to come in. And then you add it together, and you keep these hidden states. And you do that throughout the whole input sequence until you're left with like the end context vector. Um, and then you can use that to predict results. Um, but there's actually a lot of pitfalls of these types of models. One is, one is like memory problems. So uh, because you have to make so many steps through the model, it has a really tough time of remembering uh, data relationships. And then also that allows, like, that makes the model pretty tough to converge and like find an optimal minimum when you're doing the training, or a global minimum. And then also like GPUs and computers aren't optimized for uh, sequential data processing. So they take a very, very long time to train. Um, and then so, something else, uh, so there's a different type of RNN called the LSTM or, or long-term short memory. And uh, this was kind of used to help solve the memory problem. It has like a different gating system, which decides which data is kept and which is um, forgotten, which is like and put into the next cell. Uh, but this still didn't help RNNs that much. It's still had a really low training time. And they're still pretty tough to converge. And just to kind of explain how first neural machine translators work, so there's normally two parts. There's a encoder and a decoder. So in the encoder part, so you basically you know, take up, you input all the data, it goes uh, left to right um, until, and up, until you left with this one single context vector. And this context vector is supposed to have like, um, it has like a representation of the context of the sentence after it's processed through the, the network. And then the, there's a decoder part, which is gonna take the input from there and then decode it, and then produce the probability of what's the first word in the translated sentence. And then you're gonna take another step and try to predict the next word. And you're actually gonna use the already predicted words to help you predict the, ne the next word. Um, and then if you think about why like RNNs have a really tough time, time with memory and like, converging well, is that, uh, let's say you had a sentence that was like 100 words long. So normally when you're translating a sentence, like the first like, like one, two, or three, or five words like have mean, um, are pretty related to like the first couple words of the sentence you're translating. But if this was 50 words long, you're gonna have to take 50 steps through the network until you first start tr translating that first word. And then while you're like taking all those steps, the network normally forgets like the context of the first word. And that's a big issue. 
Um, and that there's now like a, like a relatively good solution to that. <clears throat> um, so now I'm gonna talk about attention and the transformer architecture, which is what I use to develop my translator. And it was just invented this past June um, by the Google Brain team. Uh, the paper is called Attention is All You Need. And uh, the inventors of this model kind of um, realized that attention mechanisms are, can be an effective way to uh, process sequential data and, and uh, develop translators. So this model uses no recurrence, which is pretty amazing, and only attention. So first off, <clears throat> so first off uh, what is attention? So attention uh, is a type of neural network layer that's loosely based off attention in human, humans. And what you're basically doing is just like, you're just gonna, anything that's important, you're gonna focus in high resolution, and anything that's not important, you're gonna block out and have, like, have that in low resolution. And how do you do this? You produce something called an attention weight matrix. So uh, the higher the weight value, means the relationship of the word is more important. So you're basically comparing like an input sequence to another like sequence or like an input sequence to itself. And as you can see here, like the lighter squares means that the relationship is more important and the model is gonna like put that in high resolution and block out everything else. And what's really important about an attention layer is that uh, there's no sequential processing. So you can attend to, you can find the relationship of the first and last word in the sentence in one step, unlike an RNN. And you actually attend to every word at the same time. Um, and that like, allows for the model to train a lot better and converge better. So how does the math and attention work? So I just want to briefly go over it. So uh, just so I talked about you had the attention weight matrix. That's going to be like this part right here. And then uh, here's like the values that you apply it to. So attention consists of queries, keys, and values. Um, and you, you can think of like the keys and values here, like a dictionary, and then your queries are here. And you're gonna do a dot product and multiply these get together to get the attention weight matrix. And then you scale it, and then you apply a softmax to get them all within sum up to one. And then you apply the attention weight matrix to the values you wanna like attend to and figure out what's the important relationship. And uh, so here is the architecture of the transformer. And so it uses no recurrence, and it only uses attention. So uh, the orange parts are where the attention happens. The yellow parts are uh, normalization to help the model converge better. And then there's some extra like feed forward networks to just help the model develop some more nonlinear relationships. Um, and then there's also, uh, because of attention, you like sequential positioning doesn't matter. You can attend to any word in the input sequence at once. But when you're developing a translator, normally words which are pretty close to each other um, like are pretty important when you're trying to like, translate the text. So to make up for that in this model, you actually do something called a positional encoding. It's like the special sine wave function to allow the model to just understand like the context next to the words. Um, and this model actually uses something called multi-head attention. So you're gonna like, have multiple attention layers, uh, well, multiple self-attention in each like, layer. Um, and if you're probably wondering where like, these queries, keys, and values come from, uh, so essentially, you start with like, your input word vectors, so have how many words you have in your sentence. And you're gonna linear project these three times to uh, queries, keys, and values, and then you're gonna do that H times. Uh, so you're gonna do, like, do multiple attention in the layer. And then uh, you concat those together, and then uh, you like, linear transform it again, and you end up with output word vectors, which are the same size as the input word vectors. Um, you know, it's maybe a lot to take in all at once. I definitely would, didn't pick it up this quick when I first read the paper. <laughs> but uh, essentially the main key concept is this, is that you, know, you start off with your input word vectors, and you output word vectors, but through attention, you're attending to what's important. So these output word vectors are gonna have like, you know, it's gonna have what's important in high resolution, it was not important in low resolution, which allows the model to uh, just have a better understanding of the sentence context and what you're trying to translate to. Um, so here is like a cool GIF of the attention model in action. Uh, so you have your encoding and your decoding. So you start off with your input words, you know, each of these are a word vector, and then through each layer of the network, you're gonna tend to all words at the same time and produce new word vectors. That's the filled in circles. And these new word vectors have like more of context of what the sentence actually means. 
And then when you're decoding, you're gonna look at the whole entire uh, encoded word vectors and produce output words one by one. Um, and you're gonna kind of, when you're decoding, you're gonna actually create new word vectors to help you decode. And you're gonna look at the already predicted uh, words to help you predict the next word in the sentence until you hit like that end token. And then you know the translation's over. Okay, so how well does this model perform? So the, tra um, the transformer uh, was applied to the WMT translation contest, and it was able to get a blue score of 28.4. So that was seven years better than 2016, which is a big jump. Uh, and you also can notice that the, the, the transformer was able to translate at least a thousand times quicker than other state-of-the-art models. So why is that? So attention is completely feed forward. There's no sequential processing. So it's optimized for GPU performance and computational parallelization. Um, and why is this exactly? So if you look at the maximum path length, so the length it takes to like, attend to you know, like a word in the model, one word to the next, attention, you can attend to all words in one step. So the maximum path length of any word in a sentence to another word is one. But for recurrent neural networks, if you're trying to find the relationship of the first word to the last word, you're gonna to have to make n steps to the network, which is the length of the sequence. And this just like makes the model have a much tougher time, like increases the training time a lot, and makes it a lot, like makes the memory a lot worse, and it makes it a lot tougher to converge. And then, so I like edited the graph from earlier. So as you can see, just a year later, we're now seven points better, and this trend is continuing to be linear and deep learning is continuing to amaze people and produce like breakthrough results, which we, did, we thought weren't possible at all. Um, and I, I can imagine what this which would be like 10 years from now. <laughs> um, but another really important part about attention, uh, so in the AI community, there's a huge movement for having interpretable models. And most neural networks, you just have no idea how they work, you can't understand it. But with attention, it actually opens up the AI black box and you can figure out how a model makes a decision. So how could you do that exactly? So when you input sequences of the model, you can look at the weight values uh, in the sentence to figure out like, what the model is attending to, and what's the important relationship in that sentence. And to give you an example of this, if we go back to the sentence earlier, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So if you look at the attention weights um, attached to the word it, you can see that the model, um, you know, it looks at animal, it looks at street, but there's a higher attention weight to animal. And why is that? Because the word tire is there, and it intuitively knows, like a human does, that um, an animal can get tired and a street can't. But, you know, if we inputted it, the sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide, uh, it actually attends to street more, because street is more of a reason um, for someone to not walk across it, like a wide street, than like the animal being too wide. So like these models are smart like humans, they're intuitive, they understand language, and that's like pretty incredible. And just to kind of like go back and forth, you can just tell that just one, this one word changes at the bottom, and you can just, it changes the attention weights. So that, that's like amazing. Okay, so now for the cool part, the hands-on tech. So um, I actually didn't you know, code all this on my own. So Google uh, open sourced this library called Tensor to Tensor, which is a really, really awesome library. So they kind of wanted to accelerate the research community uh, and deep learning. So they, they open sourced all their like, research models and like, their latest say the art developments. And they create this library where you can use binaries to easily train models. And they supply data sets, they supply all the TensorFlow code to train the model, and then each of their models could actually take any type of input data, whether it's images, text, or time series. So it's really awesome what they're doing. And they always update it and um, are continually adding new stuff. And, you know, they have like generative adversarial networks in there, reinforcement learning models, other advanced NLP stuff, and like convolutional neural nets. So I use this library but I, I didn't really like using binaries. I like having things in notebooks so I could look at the results and keep things in memory. So I, had, I actually ended up reverse engineering the library so I could put it in a notebook. And uh, I'll show you that in a bit. 
And then, um, so another really awesome part about Data Haiku is once you kind of develop your data pipeline and train your models, which you like a lot, you can put those models into production and uh, create API endpoints for real-time scoring. So I use our platform to create API endpoints with the, the TensorFlow model to uh, call it from any other external product um, to like translate something. And I actually I integrated this with our team chat. Um, so, so here is the notebook for developing the translator. Um, so in tensor to tensor, you know, they like pre-code almost everything is awesome. So you define like a problem. So the problem is translating English to French with a 32K vocab size with the WMT data set. Uh, I'm gonna choose the transformer model. And then they also supply a bunch of like default hyperparameters. So I'm gonna choose the transformer based uh, hyperparameters. And then to generate data, it's like super easy. Um, you know, this, this library automatically like downloaded like 30, 130 million rows of text translations. Uh, uh, I didn't have to collect that myself. Uh, you just like generate data um, and you set a training directory to store your TensorFlow model checkpoints. And then, uh, so here I load the eight hyperparameters for the model and uh, my GPUs didn't have enough uh, RAM to have the same uh, batch size as the one from the paper. So I had to adjust it and play around with the learning rate to find like a good convergence. So I did that here. So here you can see all the hyperparameters for the model. I use this dropout, um, an atom optimizer, uh, learning rate decays, all that. Uh, for what? The learning, oh, so I was, uh, yeah, so he asked how did I know the limit was for the batch size? Yeah, um, so I only had one GPU. And the paper, they had a batch size of 4,000 and, what was it, 94? Uh, 92. Um, and I, uh, I just kind of first tried that, didn't work. So uh, we just did it in half, didn't work. We just did it in half again, then it worked. So it was like, okay, so this is the batch size I'm gonna use. <laughs> and then I just played around with the learning rates, uh, got, got it to converge well finally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, the higher the batch size, the quicker the model trains. So, um, and then here's some options for distributed training. And then, uh, so it, this this library creates a TensorFlow experiment object right here. If any of you are familiar with that, to train the model. And you know, I could just restart this notebook right now and run it. And so I trained the model. It took around a day to train. Uh, from the time I, cho I chose the right hyperparameters. But, uh, so here it is, you know, it creates a TensorFlow graph for you. And it's like so awesome, because there's minimal code, but you can create these really advanced architectures, as you just saw. And they have a lot of other models in here. Um, so I guess we can come back to this later, and we can check the training progress. Uh, so here's like the, you know, this, the Tensor to Tensor also, they have TensorBoard integration, and they are automatically like, uh, put everything on TensorBoard for, for you. So uh, like here's the loss. Um, so here's the blue score, which is what we want to optimize for, for translation. And I got it to around f like 43 for English to French, which is a pretty good blue score. Uh, and the grasp we saw earlier was from English to German. It's tough for, for computers to translate that, but uh, say the art model is around like 30 for that, but they can translate French better. Uh, some other stuff. And then, so once I trained my model, uh, and I had, you know, the TensorFlow model files, I uh, ended up creating an API endpoint in Data IQ. So you can do that by clicking here, going to API services. And uh, <clears throat> so you can create API endpoints from your, the models you can make with our visual GUI really easily. But uh, because this was a kind of a TensorFlow model, I had to use some code to make it. So uh, here's a function to uh, encode the word vectors from the input text, and then decode the word vectors to the output text. And then this function initializes the weights for the TensorFlow model. And then this actually does the, the translation. And uh, TensorFlow 1.5 is something called eager execution, which basically you don't have to do session.run. Uh, so that made it a lot simpler and easier to load the, the weights. Uh, 
Um, so here's like, when I upload this API endpoint to the API node for data haiku, it would initialize the weights first, which made the API endpoint call a lot quicker. And then here is where I do the prediction. So I call the translate function on the input text right here and return it. And then, uh, so once I create this API endpoint, I integrate it to our, our uh, HipShot bot called RexBot. So, uh, so right here is where I actually call the API endpoint. Um, so the args is where the text from HipChat come from. And then uh, I call the endpoint, this returns the result, this actually gets the text, and then the, the bot will return the translated text. Um, and to see this in action, so here's this French text, which I have no idea what it means. <laughs> um, and so I got this, this was like a description of an article from this famous uh, French newspaper called Le Monde. So let's see what this article was about. So I was gonna call the API endpoint. Uh, so I, because our, uh, so I actually had to use CPUs for the decoding part because we didn't have CUDA 9 installed and in TensorFlow 1.5 you need to have CUDA 9. So that was a bummer. So in the uh, Antarctica, warming of the oceans is increasing the penicing areas to the south and the distance to be traveled by parents to feed their Testing is becoming increasingly important. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's try this sentence. And like they, they speak French in their team chats like every day, way too much. It's really annoying because I, I have no idea what they're saying. Like seriously, <laughs> but now we now we have a solution to that. So. Uh, Scientific workers analyze large volumes of data and are indispensable for the digital transformation of firms. And you know this model, so I made two models, one to translate French to English, and then if I wanted to seem smart to my French coworkers, I can like translate something on the side and seem like I know French. So I made a English to French one also. So Alex is happy because he can now speak French to his team members. Uh, I'm, I'm a French uh, genius now. Uh, just <laughs> and then, uh, did IQ is the best data science platform in the world? I have to say a true statement. Did IQ is, I'm not even gonna try, I can't, I can't pronounce French. <laughs> Pure American. So, uh, yeah, so now this actually just got integrated today. So I was really excited to uh, see it come together in time for the presentation, so that was awesome. Uh, so some concluding remarks. Wait, what's one, we already questions this, though. Um, so uh, what's next? So I'm really excited to see how uh, attention can accelerate other deep learning architectures and models. So you can actually integrate it with like LSTMs by uh, just looking at the hidden states of all these cells and then putting attention on that. So it allows you just to attend into like the old memory. Um, and actually has improved LSTM models a lot. Uh, so they've actually used this pure attention for having actually good results for like syntactic parsing, questioning, answering machines, and even image processing, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then it opens up the AI black box, which is great. Uh, and then something I think would be really cool also is to make a multi-language translator. So how Google Translate works, they actually have one neural network model that can take any input language and then translate that to any output language. Uh, so, and they do this by just adding a token at the beginning of the text input to what they want to end up to translate to. And then they just train the network and it works. I think that's pretty incredible and it will be a lot better instead of training a model for each input output language, you just have one to do any, everything. So uh, that's it. Thank you everyone for coming and listening to the presentation. Uh, so here, here is the link to the research paper if any of you want to learn more about attention and the transformer model. Uh, and here's a link to the Tensor to Tensor API. 
And uh, I decided to publicly post my notebook. Uh, that I reverse engineered it to make it a lot easier to use. So you can download that or fork the repository from there. Uh, here's my contact. And Data IQ is hiring. We're growing really quick. Uh, we're hiring data sales engineers, customer success managers, and more in New York City, London, and Paris. So uh, thank you all for coming, and I uh, hope you enjoy the presentation. Yeah. Uh, Okay. One, one, two. One, two. I was going to ask about uh, the distinctions that you made. You referred to the challenges between, let's say, French and German. Um, what's the what's the smartest way to approach those distinctions and and, uh, and get a positive, uh, productive result? Uh, I mean, I, I you know I don't know German, I know French, so I can't really talk much about the language differences and how they're different. But uh, I would assume that because the model is able to translate better English to French, that uh, the relationships are just easier. Like um, tensors are more similar. Uh, there's not as much like special use cases, and German would probably have more of that, which makes it uh, difficult, more difficult to translate. So. Yeah. Uh, this was not very clear in the paper. So during the training part, uh, the the uh, tension potential library uses uh, teacher forcing or not? But sorry, can you say that again? I mean, I'm asking during training, does it use teacher forcing? Uh, the library? Yes. Yeah, it does everything for you. No, um, no, no. I must whether it uses teacher forcing. So there are teacher forcing or auto regressiveness. Teacher forcing means feeding the true input during decoding part. But auto regressiveness feeding the previous output in the as a next stage input. So uh -huh. from the paper, it's not clear. That's why I'm asking. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, okay. Take it easy. So my first question is, so when you're transferring from like, English to uh, French, what is the human like performance? Because I'm wondering if you are familiar with that. Uh, I mean, it depends how good of a translator you are. Uh, I would definitely be like zero. <laughs> um, but I, th um, I think deep learning models now are about reaching human level. So. Uh, also depends on the sentence. Probably we're not there quite yet, but uh, we're getting really close. So. Thank you. So when um, historically Google used to do something like word to vec to encode a sliding window of context, so literally learning association between words that have a reasonably short distance yeah. from one another. So where is the main difference between that and something like uh, the attention model? That in effect you're encoding um, sort of like a, a decoder degree of association between yeah. the words to everything in some sort of uh, window. Yeah, so, so where's the main benefit on that? Uh, yeah, it's simply learning the sliding window context. Yeah, so if you, if you look back at the attention model, these are the encoding layers, and this is where the attention happened. So how attention works is you're basically, there's actually two different types of input. So in the coding layer, you're going to compare the input sequence to itself. And then when you're decoding it into here, the, uh, the keys and queries are gonna come from the uh, encoder, and then the values are gonna come from the decoder part. Um, and what uh, essentially happens in attention is that uh, as these word vectors come in, you know, they're gonna be outputted in the same size, but uh, so all that, you know, like information, this hidden information, this word vectors, it's just gonna like cancel out the stuff that's not important. So like royalty isn't important, this age is important, but maybe femininity and masculinity is. Um, it would just reduce those values and these new word vectors would have more context. I mean, it's, you know, it's like deep learning. It's kind of really tough for kind of 
us humans to understand how it like, works in every single step. But the basic premise is that uh, you know, it just kind of rearranges the word vectors so that when they actually hit that probability of predicting the word, it's like better. So uh, does that answer the question? All right. Yeah. Um, but um, at some point, somebody had to train the attention model to create values and anchors and so forth. What did you use to create the attention model to be a large set of translated books or something? So, uh, so what did I use? Like, what data did I use? So. Uh, Tensor to tensor supplies data sets, and uh, so this function, right, I could actually, let's see. Um, yeah, I can go to the directory and show you. Um, where was this? Yeah, so it kind of uses like get requests to download these data repositories, and when you generate the data, it actually takes like five hours, uh, because it just downloads a lot of data. So, um, uh, so it takes the WMT data, uh, this common crawl data set. So when you generate like, data for a, tra a type of tra a translation problem, it has a tensor. It actually just like download everything in this one directory, so you can reuse it if you're trying to do more translation problems. But uh, this is all of it. I mean, it just downloads it from the internet for you automatically. You just specify a training directory, and then it uh, would automatically pre-process it for you. So this is like the data that's already bashed and ready to be translated to the model. Here's like my dictionary of the words that I'm gonna produce the word vectors for, and then it already pre-computes all the batches of like the 130 million uh, sentences for you automa like, automatically. All right, so uh, let's give uh, Alex another hand. That was absolutely great. Yeah, thank you.